everybody and welcome to this evening's event, The Extraordinary Life of Charles Ignatius Sancho. Um, I'm really excited to have you all here in person. Also excited to have people online watching. Um, just a quick hello to the people at the Living Knowledge Libraries in Bristol, Reading, Jersey and Norfolk. Um, my name's Rebecca, I am the director of HistFest, who's partnering with the British Library on this event. So I just want to say a big thank you to the British Library for partnering with us on this. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with the library on um, events here. As you can probably see from looking around in this really grand entrance, they do have an exhibition coming up um, on Alexander the Great, which is worth checking out. Um, if you're interested in further HistFest events, there's some flyers down at the bottom there, so you can have a look at an event we've got coming up about the regicide of Charles I. Um, now, on to our um, speaker and event chair. Chairing the event this evening, we have an award-winning author of fiction for young people, Catherine Johnson. Catherine's written over 20 books for young readers, um, including my daughter's favorite, Freedom, which has been described, not by my daughter, um, by the press, as an outstanding story of slavery from a hugely accomplished writer. Freedom is a short, pacey read, bursting with action and vibrant characters who leap off the page. She's been nominated for the Carnegie Medal, as well as winning awards for historical fiction. She also writes for TV, including adapting Miranda Kaufman's Black Tudors, as well as for film, radio, and video games. Her latest book, which is on sale at the bookshop, is Journey Back to Freedom, a book for young readers about the life of a, lau a Lauda Equiano. Um, and speaking today, we have Patterson Joseph. Ahead of this event, um, I... I he suggested that I keep the introduction brief, and I quote here by saying, um, flunked high school, acted, became chancellor of Oxford Brooks. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Um, Patterson jo Joseph is a highly acclaimed British stage and screen actor. He's appeared in Vigil and Noughts and Crosses, and as we were just discussing back in the green room, Casualty, which I was unaware of, um, Timeless, Peep Show, Law and Order, and is set to play Arthur Slugworth in the forthcoming Wonka movie. Um, as of this week, as I've mentioned, it was announced that he's been appointed Chancellor of Oxford Brookes University. He's also a brilliant writer and has dedicated a lot of his prose to exploring the life of one individual in particular, writing the one-man play Sancho, An Act of Remembrance, and also um, the book that he's here to speak about this evening, his fantastic debut novel, The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho. Now, we're going to begin the event this evening by a reading from Patterson Joseph's new book, and then we'll move on to um, a discussion before opening out to audience questions. Um, but first of all, I'd like you to put your hands together to welcome on stage for the reading, Patterson Joseph. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi. Hello, thank you for coming out on a rainy Friday night in London. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, it's strange to just come out and read. It feels weird. I want to say hello first so you can hear what my voice is before I start doing funny voices. Um, I love this man. I've loved him for 20 years and uh, finally thought it's time to tell his inner story. Everything about Sancho is public. The wonderful Gainsborough portrait, which is the first time I saw him, it struck me so viscerally. How could this man be? It was the question in my head. Oh, who is this? Is this made up? Is this Hogarth saying what they would, a black person would look like? And then I discovered his story and I was lost. Um, so I did a play, which was also public because it's a monologue, I'm being painted by Gainsborough and it starts that way, the audience watching him being painted, and then I wrote uh, a section where he's in his grocer's store in Westminster talking to the customers coming in, and then the hustings, which is public, and so I thought, what does he really think? What does he think about his life? And as an actor, that's what I do, think about the inner monologue of a character. So. I'm going to start the book from the beginning. I've never done this before. I've always read bits from the middle, but uh, I'm going to start at the beginning. Good place to start. <laughs> I keep forgetting how old I am. 
Yeah, that's better. This is a Sancho quote. If you adopt the rule of writing every evening your remarks on the past day, it will be a kind of friendly tete-a-tete between you and yourself, wherein you may sometimes happily become your own monitor. And hereafter, those little notes will afford you a rich fund whenever you shall be inclined to retrace past times and places. Charles Ignatius Sancho, 1729 to 1780. Prologue, 1775. 46 years old. Time away from one's diary is as valuable as a little time away from one's lover. Absence not only softens the tender feelings toward the beloved other, it also provides the benefit of perspective that renders the object of affection so much more precious and beautified. So too, with quill, ink, and leaf, I reunite my body with my mind, and the pleasure this act gives me has grown rather than diminished. For I speak and write to purpose now. I seek to lay forth a history that speaks of all the truths of my life up to this present day, to survey, like the architect of my own life, the line where I have followed that brought me here. My history, not chaotically rendered, as in my earliest diary entries, no, as I see them now, put together to make sense of the whole. This for you, my son, William Leach Osborne Sancho, born last Friday, 20th day of October, exactly at half past one in the afternoon, my second son, my only living son. I will speak to you as you will be, as I see you in my mind's eye, when you will find these pages carefully concealed in my old room at Windsor Castle. I speak to Billy, the gentleman. The instructions for finding these will be given to you before I pass. I, I know with a certain knowledge that I will not live to see you at man's estate. So here am I, addressing the man, Billy Sancho. Know thy father and forgive him. I will not stint on necessary detail, but have no time for flights of fantasy or anecdote not pertinent to my aim, neither which is no less than to render the truth of a complex web of a life, a life lived in many kingdoms, or so it seems to me presently. I'm now a shop owner, but hold enough, I gallop ahead, and must grasp the reins of my memory more firmly. Much of the following comes from my diary entries over the years. I will record my retrospective interjections. These may be useful in aiding my Billy, to navigate the story of your father's life thus far. This rendering may benefit older Sancho too, when time has eroded precision in the recollection of even the most momentous twists and turns of a momentous life. I began writing a diary in earnest at the age of 17. Those entries will appear in these pages as I see fit. For the present, I will begin at the beginning. Book one, 1729 to 1749. Chapter one, in which Charles Ignatius Sancho relates his early life. 1729, origins. I had, on reflection, little right to survive born on a slave ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean on what is quaintly described as the Middle Passage. I now say, a slave ship 
is neither in a passage, nor does it navigate the middle of anywhere. It sails straight to the heart of hell. My future articulacy would have astounded my master, standing a safe distance from the helpless African girl of unknown origin, a daughter of Eve from somewhere along the Guinea coast. Neither would it have occurred as a possibility to my terrified boy father, traumatized by the last day's events and near paralyzed, emasculated by fear of the unknown. In contrast, his wife, my mother, is simply, luckily, lost in the bewildered agony of a painful breech birth. Lucky to be together at all, these child parents captured and sold as slaves, I would guess, by a rival tribe's chief. The human spoils of war. Lucky. A charnel house of black flesh, this. Cramped and rank with rat droppings and the spillage of a thousand filthy slop buckets. Filth amassed over the 15 years of this shit's barbaric life. A life spent plying its brutal, unfeeling trade between the pestilential slaughterhouses of the Guinea, or Slave Coast, and the slow death of plantation life in the Americas, which awaited the cursed souls who were doomed to never return home. Neither they nor their offspring. A permanently lost tribe. Let us roam. Leaving the child parents to their agonies for a moment, let us venture to the next deck down. No, not that lower mezzanine deck. That one is for the pickaninnies. Oh, they can really pack them in there. Conveniently small, these little ones. They hardly complain at all, but simply lie in stupefied terror. All the better. Much less trouble that way. Quieter. No, we need to look at the lowest deck. We find the men's quarters, quite the largest space in the ship. Roomy. Or at least it would be if 300 men were not crammed head to toe so tightly that no room can be afforded for the slightest movement without feeling the calloused skin of a stranger's feet or the tangled woolly roughness of the hair of one's neighbor pungently ripe with sweat and the acrid smell of fear and death. The rhythmic rolling of the ship, accompanied by the groans of hundreds of men who cannot speak or understand each other's languages. Divide and rule starts early in the seasoning process. That shameless word for the conditioning for a life of slavery that the white and black traders along this treacherous coast give to the slave apprenticeship. An apprenticeship that starts in earnest once the enslaved soul has reached their destination, usually a plantation of one kind or another, cotton, sugar, cane, tobacco, crops that bring ready money, commerce. Where will your cruelty end? Let us hurry back up to the birth cabin. Our young mother-to-be is about to bring our main subject forth, past the mid-deck with the women and young girls deck, half the area of that of the men, and made more uncomfortable for them by the fact that some are in stages of pregnancy, akin to Our Lady of above, who we now see has expired. There is the dumbstruck master, the surgeon charged with mid midwifery duties, guiltily sullen, the near catatonic gaze of the frightened boy father, now without a soul who knew him free. He has the fleeting notion to bolt from the room, perhaps to fling himself overboard, broken by the loss of his wife his life's companion, futile. He will be shackled below with the rest. What are the debris left in the wake of this storm of grief, the mewling, puking infant boy? Soon baptized, Charles Ignatius, after the father of the Jesuits, and growing round and strong, uh, always round, in New Granada, On arrival, Billy, when first my father, your grandfather, saw that the color of the majority of laborers on that benighted dock matched his own, 
he set his eye on a dozing overseer's unguarded scabbard, seized the man's sword, then swiftly slipped the blade from his own guts to his heart before any had time to register the act. He died in merciful seconds, and my world contracted yet again. This, the story I have pieced together from the fragments I harvested from servants' gossip, the indiscretions of my guardians, my own meditations, my nightmares. My story is just that, a story, neither better nor worse than any enslaved orphan of Afrique. <clears throat> Thank you. And we're going to welcome Catherine onto the stage now. Um, just and thank you for that. That was really moving. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention at the very beginning is the, the live captions. If you're watching from home, you can um, click to enable them on your screen. And also the music that you listen to on your way in um, was an actual composition of um, Sancho's by Ben Parks, well, performed by Ben Parks, um, who you can find at parkmusic.com. Thank you. I will leave you to the discussion. So if it's closed caption, does it mean I have to speak very slowly? Because that's quite hard for me. Oh, or very fast. Or very, oof, I can do that. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for that. I, I'm, it's lovely to see, gosh, so many people lovely, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and about a book for which I am really passionate about its subject is almost probably as much as you are. You can, I think that writing a novel is probably most like falling in love. And so the first question I'm going to ask you is how you first met Sancho and what what was it? How did you fall into the sort of pit of mm. wanting to know more? I, um, th I think the first time I met Sancho was in Gretchen Gerdziner's book, Black England. Mm -hmm. And uh, I opened that uh, book and uh, it was, the reasons I was uh, getting into it was probably well known by some now. I basically... I went to drama school, I love the European classics, I'm really good at them, but I wasn't getting a look in, so I wanted to be in a costume drama. So I thought, I thought you know what I could do? If I found a character, no one could refute it, and they and say, well, darling, you know, there were no black people in England before 1948, so therefore you can't be an usher. But then, then, then as a, if I could find a character, give it to a writer, because I didn't have the confidence to be a writer myself, then they could write the story and I could be in it. That was my deal. And that's what I thought I was going to do. So I opened Gretchen's book, and there's Septimia Severus. And my head has just gone like, boing, boing, boing. Libyan, emperor of Rome, comes to England to match Julius Caesar, who wasn't able to tame this filthy rock in the middle of a dirty sea. So it's the back end, I need to say something rude then, back end of the empire, we all know what I mean, and he's come to England with his two sons, Caracalla and Gaeta, and his wife, Julia Domna, who's from Syria, and they are governors of Britain, and they rebuild Hadrian's Wall, and I'm like, what world am I in? Okay. And Sancho was one of the characters in that book. I hope you've read Bernardine Evaristo's book called The Emperor's Babe, which I is... Have. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so you fell down, you met him there, and mm. then you fell down that hole, and you thought, this is a character. It, it was a BAFTA worthy character. It was an, yes, I'm a shallow actor at heart. It was an Olivier Award winning. I've never been nominated for any of these things, by the way. But I, this was the one. I mean, he apparently had some sort of speech impediment. Oh my gosh, I could really do something there. Uh, he, was, he was grossly obese. Fat suit. This is gonna. The transformation is gonna be amazing, and that's was the first. That one of the first things I thought about him was that his life is just ridiculously colourful. It's like some sort of strange Forrest Gump of the 18th century. It's like he met everybody. Well, I, I, I was going to get onto that before we get onto that though. So when did you first see his actual letters? Did you? When, oh, 
the, the actual yes. physical letters. Yes. I have never touched his actual physical letters. I've, I've, I've read the, you know, You've read the wonderful book. Vincent Coretta's collation uh -huh. of the letters, uh -huh. but the, the letters themselves, I think I might have seen one here at the, at the library. That was what I, the, the first, it's the Sieg into the first clip, which actually later on, you know that. But did you do research here? Did you come and do Yeah, yes, here? I did. And uh, Ben Park, whose wonderful music you've, you've heard, um, and if you get, he's, there's an album that he, he has, you can get on iTunes or whatever, you get your, um, your music, and the first sort of eight minutes is just me telling Sancho's story with his music accompanying mm -hmm. me, so it's, it's, worth a, it's worth a listen to. Mm -hmm. And then Ben has done three or four tracks of, of Sancho's music. Um, I came here, Ben, sorry, Ben, <laughs> ben, ben went into the archives here and found that music, and that was the first time, really, that I'd seen Sancho's okay. music, um, and of course I was sort of busy researching um, around the 18th century here. So it yeah, was it's a beautiful building, and it has been uh, it's a, go a godsend for me. Can we have the first clip then? I'm so sorry. Because this okay. is Didn't you know there were clips? Yes, clips. Aha! Okay. Uh -huh. This is the British Library, the most amazing library in England. It's where I researched this fella. This is my new novel. It's called The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho. And Charles Ignatius Sancho was the first black man to vote in England. That would have been in 1774 and then again in 1780. An extraordinary man. He was a musician. He was a, an actor. And he was a voter because he was a grocer in Westminster. A fascinating man with a, a fascinating story. Um, inside this place, of course, you can find his letters. You can see his actual handwriting and the handwriting of his son, William, who became a, a publisher later in life, and his daughter, a black woman who could write in the 18th century. Fascinating. So in I go, treasure hunting. I was more interested in the people behind me. <laughs> Who's this man? What's he doing? So, what, I mean, you've never, you, this is your first novel, okay? And it's absolutely the texture of it, the feeling of it. How did you find exploring the 18th century? Uh, um, what I'm trying to say is, did you find that harder than you expected, or was it just something that you fell into, just creating that world? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been an actor for now 33 years, and so much of the stuff that I've done has been, like I say, the European classics. So uh, I once was given the role of Mr. Worthy in George Farquhar's uh, The Recruiting Officer mm -hmm. at, the, at the National Theatre by the lovely uh, Nicholas Heitner. And um, this would have been way back in 92. And so I'm a demon for research. Mm -hmm. And I love researching and I love finding out strange facts, but I just love finding out about other times and seeing out of the eyes of those people and I knew quite a bit about the 18th century already but getting into Sancho specifically I'd never because I get a role and I just look at what the author is trying to do look who he says that person is and find out about that life I wasn't looking for black people in a, the 18th century in 1992. I just wanted to know what a landowner in Shropshire would have been like and what they would have been doing. Mm. And I feel like that was the way you ought to go when you're acting, because you're not playing your ethnicity, you're playing the character first, right? And so I, it wasn't, I knew about the 18th century, I knew quite a lot around it. I've done other plays and research on it. But it was when I specifically went in to look for black British stories and working class British stories, because the two are absolutely inextricably linked, mm. that I began to sort of have my brain pop and the breadth of what I saw just got wider and wider and wider. So yeah, the 18th century was an easy one because it's the century where we changed the most as a nation. We were three, four different nations and suddenly we got an act of union in 1707, but they've got a war in the middle of that, haven't they, practically with Scotland mm -hmm. and the Jacobite Rebellion. So it's like this time when they're trying to figure out what is a United Kingdom and in the midst of this are all these immigrants, Irish immigrants and Caribbean slaves and American, African-American slaves and free African-Americans, black African-Americans and free, free Africans. Africans. And so it's a mashup of all these mm -hmm. different nations and then the insecurity of 
the French Revolution, American Revolution, in the middle of it. So, as a nation, I feel like it, it's infinitely fascinating that period. The decisions made that we still resonate, that still resonate today, mm -hmm. all of them, and so many of them were made, made in that century. And, and that, that's, so there's that general, but there's also Sancho's experience of London. I mean, he is, I mean, we know so little of his existence before. He's a Londoner, he's a, is as much a Londoner as any of us. But there's also that thing that the way he's brought up, the, his education, I mean, yes, he lives with these awful women, but he's sort of taken under the wing of the Duke of Montague. And his own personal dilemma of not knowing, not feeling black enough, and not, sorry, as, as a mixed royal one, I felt this is something that, you know, it's quite universal. Until he, he discovers the black society of London, he doesn't know where he sits. He's sort of over-educated. The way he uses words, the way you put words into his mouth, it's a big thing for him, isn't it? That feeling of not knowing where... It takes him a long time to sort of find his feet, doesn't it? Well, I mean, that's the story of the novel. And that's the story that I began to tell when I wrote the novel. The play doesn't deal with that at all because it wasn't something that I was thinking about. It's only when I started doing that act of inner monologue, what do you actually think about the world, that I realized he's an outlier. He doesn't belong in the black community necessarily because he's highly educated. He doesn't really belong with the working class community because he's highly educated. And then he doesn't really belong in the royal circles, dukes and duchesses, because he's a black man with no property, with no status whatsoever. So I wanted to deal with that, uh, that sort of wine press that he's in, where he is being crushed on all sides. No, his life hasn't been as bad as, say, his parents' lives were. And the other people who were left in New Granada were, but he has a very specific kind of trauma that he has to deal with. And part of that trauma is identity. Mm -hmm. Who am I then? Because I don't belong there and I don't belong here. So what am I? So there is a kind of recreation of himself that he has to do. And that is, that is really the story yeah. of him discovering that through his diaries as he gets older. Who am I actually? Yeah. Where do I belong? And the way he's talking to his son. I, I was very impressed uh, with the structure of the book, the way you interleave, sorry, am I giving this away? The, the diary and the talking, the directly talking to his son, I mean, through letters, and the way, it, the timeline, I mean, did you struggle with, get, with deciding how, the thing is you told, sorry, I've gone wrong a bit here, I should have talked about the show you did at Wilton's before you wrote the book, which I badly missed because I do not live in London anymore. But you did a show about him first. You did that performance, that monologue. And after that, why did you then feel the need to get this down into a book? I suppose I've sort of cheated on you, Catherine, because I told them that before you came on. It basically, it, it, <laughs> I, um, everything's public portrait is a performance. A portrait is a performance anyway, always, and they particularly knew that in the 18th century. And you look at that incredible portrait, I wish we could have it come up, but you look at that yeah. incredible portrait and it is a performance. This is a valet or valet to the Duke of Montague who worked for the royal family, sure, but he's a servant and he's not painted as a servant. Why do we know that? That might have been the Duke's livery, perhaps. Um, we, um, we're talking to the lovely, um, the descendants of uh, the Dukes of Montague, uh, lovely Richard, uh, Duke of Buccleuch, and trying to figure out what that livery looked like. But the, whatever he was wearing, which is this amazing red waistcoat and this gold braiding and the gold buttons and the dark blue frock coat and the way he's not even looking at us, he's looking off and there's a sort of sardonic kind of wry smile on his face and his hand, his working right hand, is in his waistcoat which is a sign of a man of leisure. What's that? It's a performance of some kind. Mm. It's, it's Gainsborough saying something about that guy, and it's him saying something about himself. Well, that's presentation, mm. but that's not person. Any more than this is not fully me, I'm in front of people, so I'm not going to scratch myself where I normally do. Do you know what I mean? 
So, so that's a performance. And then the letters, obviously, people, mm -hmm. not a lot of people could read. And so the man of the house, usually, or the woman of the house, would read the letter out loud by the fireside. So they're also public, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say all these deep, dark things. And it wasn't the epistolary, the letter writing art anyway, mm -hmm. to, you know, Twitter like, oh, I feel terrible this morning. They don't do that. They talk around things, they imply, but they never bellyache about anything. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the play. And the play, as I, as I described it, is also a public show. Mm -hmm. That's what the novel can do that no other form of art can do. Mm -hmm. There's signs on a page, symbols. They go into your head and they form pictures. It's amazing. It shouldn't be, but it is. Mm -hmm. It's mm. just a miracle. And that's the best form to whisper stories into people's heads. I mean, the audiobook's brilliant, by the way. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted Idris Elba, but I said no. I don't <laughs> Um, but, um, <laughs> no, I embargoed that from the beginning, actually, though, just in case. No, but um, that's the point to me. The point is, yes, I, as soon as I start speaking, I'm sort of, if you like, mitigating between your imagination and mm -hmm. the book. So I, I'm now, that's another performance. So you're going to hear it differently. You're going to hear different, uh, there'll be a different energy to the way you read it, different voice. You didn't imagine that yeah. voice was going to be like that. Yeah. So... This is the pure form. This is the get out of the way of the uh, listener, reader uh, way of allowing a story like Oliver Twist did to me. I've got pictures of Oliver Twist, nothing to do with any film I've ever seen. I've got pictures of David Copperfield. I, I mean, pictures of Jane Eyre. I can see Grace Poole in that window, the fire. I can see her. I can feel the tension when she's in that school at the beginning and she doesn't know what's going on. Everything's so dark. That's not a movie. That's in here, the movie's in here, from those squiggles on the page. I, I think I, I'd say, I, I agree with you, obviously, as a, as a writer, I, but I do think, I do think, as somebody who sort of brought up on telly, I think the Grace Pool I see is probably from a 70s adaptation. But that's another story. But oh, possibly, get, but yeah. there is a fire, and <laughs> that's what's in my head. I, I didn't get that wrong, did I? No. Somebody say, yes, no. there's a fire, right? No, no. I, I want to talk about the letters, because you, you hinted uh, earlier that um, one of the things that Sancho did, apart from his various jobs, and you think how much time, and writing the music, was these letters to so many famous people of the time. Yeah, some famous people and just some mates of his. But, of course, we pick out the shiny ones, yeah. like Lawrence Stern who he wrote to a couple of years before Stern died, and they had a beautiful relationship, which is in this book, and a very important relationship. And um, Sancho's confidence just grew, I think, mm. as a writer. Um, and <laughs> somebody, uh, they weren't complaining. It was a very nice thing. I, I, I don't read reviews as an actor. I haven't read reviews for about 25 years. What's the point? I don't know what you had for dinner. I don't know who you are, but you said that you think this is marvelous. Well, you might do, but I'm not sure that it was a good night. Or you might think this is awful, but I don't know you. So I don't read them. What's the point? And of course, with the book, I'm like, well, it's done. It's done. I'll, 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 I'll read. And somebody said, um, yes, I like this and I like that. It's usually a preamble to, but I didn't like. So they went, um, and then the letters, of Van Sa they, 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 the letters, they sound like they were written by somebody else. Well, that is <laughs> boring. <laughs> so I was kind of glad by that. It's like, yes, I was trying to get into a different voice. Thank you for recognizing that in a negative way, but that's right. And then they went, far too many dashes in the last part of the book after he meets Stern. And I'm like, okay, well, you haven't read Lawrence Stern then because uh, I, I write very linearly in comparison to Lawrence Stern and uh, the dashes are, are really important. Yeah. Style, right? Yeah. Yes, that's what I was going to say. So it's the writing, when century. he wrote to these guys, yeah. uh, particularly Stern, he just admired him so much that he began, you could see it in his letters, to yeah. imitate the style and nice. imitate the uh, syntax and also the making up of words, you know. And, um, and, and that, I think, is... is the, the letters are great because they're domestic. That's what I love about Sancho, is that, yeah, he's this big guy, he's got this big reputation, he did all these amazing things, but he had a wife from the Caribbean, possibly born in Whitechapel, actually. She was definitely baptised in Whitechapel, but 
Maybe she came from Antigua or Barbados originally. And or Jamaica. Well, Jamaica was a generic term for the no, whole of the No, but Caribbean. I'm just... I'm, That's I'm, because I'm, you're Jamaican, yeah, Catherine. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just claiming... Doesn't mean that they weren't I'm other islands, like St. Lucia. <laughs> Saint Lu thank you. Uh, hey, thank you very much. But no, I mean, that's the amazing thing, isn't it? The domesticity of, what, of thinking family. about a black family. In and he had uh, nine children now, we know. They're growing every year. They keep, people keep doing The Sanchonettas. So. The Sanchonettas are growing year by year. The wonderful people at the New College of the Humanities, after I'd finished, after I'd finished the book, suddenly discovered two new eldest children. Thank you very much indeed. Mary Ann Sancho mm -hmm. and uh, Thomas Johnson, which is hilarious to some people, Thomas Johnson <laughs> Sancho. It's a good name. Um, and I, I actually, I, there's a school in um, Victoria, I'm getting the subject, we are going to the clip in a minute, where they, they're sure that at least William went, Greycoats Hospital in, in Westminster, but the, there's somebody trawling the records to see well, I hope they if find any it. of the Sanchos were there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we do need to go to the second clip, so you've got to look at yourself speaking there. I don't have to look at myself, I can look at you looking at me. <laughs> what does that look like? I'm very excited to be finally able to open the first edition. Well, actually, you say the first edition, it was actually the second edition. The first edition was printed two years after Sancho died, but this is his son Billy. That's his work, because he was a printer. And his print store would have been in Newsgate, which happens to be now the National Gallery site. But here we are, I'm opening it up. Letters of the late Ignatius Sancho, an African. London, published December the 20th, 1802, by William Sancho, Charles Street, Westminster. So that's interesting, because it says 1802, published from the print works at number 20, Charles Street, Westminster. Now, 20, uh, 19, in fact, was the store. So 19 and 20, they might have bought the store next door. They must have been doing quite well then, at that point. But is that the print works? And then he had a bookstore in Newsgate. Who knows? The weird thing about history is that it's not fixed. That we think we know everything and then we look in an archive and we go, what's this about? What is this? And we suddenly find a new avenue. For example, I thought Sancho had seven children. And I find out about three months ago, after 20 years of research, that he had two others. An elder daughter called Mary Ann and an elder son called Thomas Johnson. <laughs> so, so you can't, you can't write it, can you? Come on. Yeah, Thomas well, they, Johnson, it, it, brilliant. <laughs> and they both of them, I mean, uh, she, Marianne, lived to be 46 and he 54. We have their birth date and their death date. What are these hundred years worth of living? Yeah. What is and, that? And Somebody where? go find out. Because that information is there. It's there. It's got to be there. I mean, the, the archives at the, um, the seat of the, the Montagues, Buclus now, uh, Boughton House, which is actually a beautiful place to visit, I, in Northamptonshire, uh, Crispin Powell, who's the amazing archivist there, is digging and trawling through all of that. But it, it is astonishing to me that we can have a hundred years of life of somebody and not know anything about what they did, where they lived. It's not, it has to be out there somewhere. So. But that, go, that, find, go find it that, and let me know. That's the thing. It's also with Equiano, his children, you know, his daughter is in Abney Park Cemetery in Stoke Newton. But it's the thing is, these people are all here mm. and their, their descendants are probably all still here. And it's just fantastic and amazing and I love it all. Um, so there he was. He met, which back to Sancho now as opposed to anyone else. So, he knew Stern. He knew Dave. He had a relationship with David Garrick as well, who was the uh, preeminent actor of his age. Yes, there's a preface to the first letters, which were printed two years after Sancho died. They had uh, it had um, the only publication that got as many subscribers before being released was the Spectator. So he, they made a lot of money. So it's probably why they were able to buy these properties. Um, uh, and in the preface, Joseph Jekyll, and I put this as a sort of audience gag in my play, 
the, uh, the, 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 he says, oh, Sancho tried his hand at acting, uh, but due to a perceived speech impediment, he was unsuccessful. I think, yes, of course, that was the reason. <laughs> Uh, but there, that, that's, what, all, that, that's kind of what we know. And then in the book, he just obsesses, in the letters, he obsesses with David Garrick. I mean, watches him, apparently spent his last three shillings, his last three shillings, to watch Garrick playing Richard III, which is like a ridiculous mm -hmm. expenditure for a man who has no money or, or means. Um, but that's how much he loved theatre. But, I, I mean, I can understand that. This is, it's like a recreation of life. Mm. And he's trying to create his own life. And it's like, how do you be? How do, which is probably what we all do through look, reading stories and, or um, experiencing stories. We're all looking for how to be. Really yes, and if you've got a forerunner, a parent, uh, an uncle, mm. somebody nearby, you can see being something that you might want to be, then you can see it and you can be it, the old phrase. But if you have no idea, there is no forerunner, there's nobody who's gone ahead and done what you've done, and maybe you can do a little better. Mm. I mean, Equiana got lucky in some ways that Sancho had made some sort of headway, pushed the boundaries in some sort of way. Oh, look, black people can be, mm. I can have intelligence. So Equiana, I'm not saying that he jumped on the back of Sancho, but he certainly was helped by that open door, that wedge that Sancho I made. But he, Sancho had no one at all to look at. I've now got to ask you about something I was sort of looking for in the book, but, you know, obviously, but the Sons of Africa. Because mm -hmm. he talks about the cause yes. right from the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. Sancho is very clear about the cause, and it's the, the, his experience of, of him and Anne going to the Somerset case yes. was lovely. I mean, I'm sorry, I know it's a horrible case, James Somerset, uh, um, uh, who was recaptured, and it, when it was Lord Mansfield took that case on before the Zong, mm -hmm. a very important in beginning to change the mind of British society, which I don't think thought about what was going on in the colonies. You know, I think there were, well, I don't know. Well, what do you think, Dante? What do I think? What do you think about that kind of, it, it's the black society and Sancho's work about the cause. Yeah, I mean, you know. there's, a, there's a, a sort of feeling, I suppose, that uh, apart from Wilberforce coming through, there would have been no big push against slavery, which is, I mean, come on. It, it's such a, an easy reading of history. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to look at white people who were very much the forerunners of people decrying the slave trade. You've got to go to the women first, who were the ones who stopped drinking, sh having sugar in their tea, when they invented the tea party, which only just really been invented. <laughs> they decided they weren't, Quaker women in particular, in, 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 at first, they weren't going to take sugar in their tea. That's quite a powerful lobby. That's your wife. You're coming home to your wife who's going, I'm not touching this filthy stuff because I believe awful things are happening in our name remotely. I mean, if you think, how could they not know? What am I wearing? Yeah, look what at am our I, What am I wearing? Where, who's made this? I got this at, you know, M&S, or I got this at John Lewis's, yeah. or I got this in whatever store. I don't know what I'm wearing, who made it? Mm -hmm. It was cheap enough for me to buy it. Um, that was the same stuff that was happening. But yeah. when the news properly, with Africans coming back and saying, this is what's going on, the momentum started. So James Groniosaur, um, a guy called Otaba Guguano, and Alauda Equiano, who we know quite a lot about, started this group called the Sons of Africa, which is a lobbying group against slavery. But if you're looking at white people, males, you've got to look at people like Thomas Clarkson, Clarkson. and Granville Sharp yeah. and his family, who sacrificed mm. their very lives to the cause. And uh, in fact, Clarkson ended up founding Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. So to rescue the African Americans and their, some of their white wives from uh, being That's persecuted the by the Americans after they'd won that war of independence. The British said we will, the British said we will take you and we will free you if you fight for us. And they did fight, they lost. 
So these people were sent to, naturally, Nova Scotia. Yeah. And died in their hundreds. And so that was awful. Clarkson petitioned the government to rescue these people. They were rescued and brought to London generally. Who knows where some of them scattered. If, you've, if you're white and you've got 7% Sub-Saharan African DNA in your system, it's probably some of these guys and, and ladies. And then it was too much for London. They wanted them out. And so they, um, Clarkson had a fantastic idea of bringing them to Africa, founding a colony. I mean, the idea was so Nuts. beautiful. Because <laughs> uh, it, it was next to, you know, it, the, the land was it, was, it was a disaster. And actually, yeah. Equiano s served on that committee and then... He, you know, he had to leave it, yeah. We, we're, getting off, we're getting off our... Seat. No, we're not. We're talking okay. about right. protest in the 18th century. And I want to tell you that everybody was protesting who could. Mm -hmm. Not everybody could. White people were protesting, black people were protesting, and the idea that it was only Wilberforce is a very thin, if you like, reading of that part of history. Yeah, I think it took a long time to sort of change minds. It was like a, a big cultural shift. Yeah. Um, because, like you said, people didn't think about it. I think we're going to have our third How long is this film? film? <laughs> There's, oh, we've, got, we've got more, you see, and, and I, I'm duty bound. This is Billy's writing, but this, fascinatingly, is Elizabeth's, the daughter, the youngest daughter. Um, so Betsy, as she was known, could write. Not very common for women at all. And her writing is, uh, it's just beautiful. I would read it, but it's very hard. Some of it's very hard to read. I can see some things. I did not then know, but I should have the honour to see you in town, soon to thank you and assure you it will be a very great act of charity if my rent is paid. It is £12 a year. So she was strapped for cash, and we're talking about 18... That looks like 1812, I don't know. But it's beautiful to see the ink, to see the, the orthography, to see the handwriting, to see the the movement, and her little jokes here, the grace of Buclue. Buclue being part of the Montague family, of course, yeah. I could devour this all day. I feel like s just reading this and being with this material feels like being with the Sanchonettas for the afternoon. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it sounds, it, it's almost idyllic because that's the other thing that you hardly ever get in black British history is that is a family, yes. a whole family. Mm -hmm. It's so often the lone man, a very rare woman like um, Phyllis Wheatley was American anyway, but it's such a, it's sort of such a precious thing, mm. that family group. And the way that he, you know, he touches on his family in the letter, he's obviously very luxurious and very, it's very attractive. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he's, um, he's besotted with Anne. I mean, besotted with him. I've never read letters like it. You know, my, my best half, my other self, my best self. I mean, he is totally in love with her from the beginning of his life to the end. And the, I suppose the novel, when I go into that, it's like, look, I mean, I'm a cynical old man, so I know that love doesn't, that kind of... Uh, love doesn't last. Sorry, kids. It's true. <laughs> but it can go into something a bit more... Sorry, shocking. <laughs> That's a spoiler. Um, but but, it, but it, go, it can go into something actually rather more deep, as we know. And add to that mm -hmm. an isolated black man mm -hmm. who can find no one like him yeah. around, and then yeah. he meets this angel. And normally I, uh, I try to contrast it. Sorry, you just got one hit of the rather heavy stuff. But there's a wonderful moment that I imagine where they first meet. Mm, and true. they were taverns in London that were frequented by black people. And that is but, where they met. Go no, there's a brilliant guidebook to London oh. in, I think it's the, the, the very, is it, it's in the 1600s. So, and it's like, the best dances in London are the black dances in Hoban. And, you know, that's a travel guide. And yet they never tell you, 
when they talk about these taverns, there's one guy's going down Fleet Street. They're usually foreign uh, visitors going, mm -hmm. oh, I've had these amazing people. Mm. They, they say that they found a tavern in Fleet Street frequented mainly by blacks and their Negro women. Now I'm thinking, okay, so let's imagine a tavern in Fleet Street, popular area to drink, that there's going to be a tavern that's just got black people in it. Unlikely. And of course, they would lump Jewish people together with black people, by the mm -hmm. way, because they were foreign and they were dark and, and they were swarthy. As well. And yeah. Indians and Arabs. And so that's what I imagine. Mm -hmm. This heaving tavern. Because they say they're called black frolics. Yeah. So what are they frolicking to? Music. Were they playing Handel? Mm -hmm. Unlikely. What were the instruments? Black Why don't instruments. you describe the instruments? Yeah. So I have black him meet instruments. Anne there and sort of try and describe or imagine what that atmosphere must have been like. And um, it's important to me mm. to people London mm -hmm. with these people. I mean, I don't just mean black people, but everybody, yeah, yeah. the Irish, yeah. who were persecuted so much because they were considered to be papists mm -hmm. and they were going to do what the French were doing and chop the heads off, their, uh, off the monarchy, you know. So they were vilified too, but there was solidarity there. Mm -hmm. And when you read accounts of what was going on in Seven Dials, very nice area now, you've got you know, apothecaries and Neil's Yard and nice pizza shops and all of that, but it was an absolute dive. I nearly swore then too, I controlled myself. Yeah. But it was, yeah. and it was a no-go area. And yet the Irish were in there, the working mm -hmm. poor were in there, and the other thing that foreign visitors would say, every corner seems to have a, a runaway slave poster. Mm -hmm. Well, how could they be? Are they exaggerating? But you read seven, eight, ten accounts like this, you say, no, it must have been quite prevalent. Why? Because of that Somerset case that mm -hmm. we spoke about and earlier cases mm -hmm. where people presumed if you got to England, you would be free you because there's no slavery in England mm -hmm. by statute. Yeah, and yet, if you come yeah. from Virginia with your slave, that slave is still a slave. Yeah. But if they ran into Seven Dials, they could be they rescued. Could be That's a story that needs yeah. to be told. So I, I am right. Oh, you're writing um, it at the moment, okay. Um, well, give it a plug, that, give it a plug. Like, I haven't finished it. But it's that thing that there is, the air in England is too sweet to support, you know, slavery. Mm. It was all that, the idea of what, what it meant to be English or Christian. You know, all the stories about, oh, well, if you are baptised, yes, and, right. and then you would be free. And, and the, the whole point was, is that it, it wasn't, there was room, there was some room. Yes, you, you might be caught, but you, so you have a character of Jonathan Sill, who is the sort of... Thief taker yeah, character, yes, yes. Yes, and the terrifying, always in the background, because how do you prove that? If you've got no papers and somebody well, even grabs if you, you have if you were papers. working poor white and they grabbed you on the street, they could ship you off to work for the Merchant Navy or the British, or the, or the Royal Navy because that's what they did, press ganging, as, as some of you would have mm -hmm. known, known about. But if you're black and you have no papers, well, you may get lucky and just be press ganged. You could get shoved onto a slave ship and back to the Caribbean or to an American plantation you go. Mm -hmm. Very precarious. Yeah, terrifying. Can I just say something? There's about papers and proving. When I did the play in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center, I opened there in 2016, 16. Um, I couldn't get a venue here, by the way. People weren't particularly interested in the story for some reason. Uh, but America uh, was very keen, and I did quite a tour over there before I came to Wilton's mm -hmm. musical. So I'm in the Kennedy Center, and it's the, um, it's the first morning. Uh, thereby hangs a tale. I mean, who? any actors out here, morning show, 11.30, 450 <laughs> screaming kids, you know the feeling. That's how I felt. I wasn't particularly happy about it, but on I went, managed to calm them down, and it was all fine. And they were brilliant, in fact. So when the Q&A, these four African-American women got up, and bear in mind, I had written this play, finished it in maybe 2010, to put it on just briefly at the, at the National Theatre Studio just to show people. And I'd been told almost by osmosis, that we were in a post-racist world. Mm -hmm. And I was living in France at the time, so I was thinking, maybe I've lost touch. <laughs> maybe I don't know, and everything's great <laughs> over there, and this is going to be an old and annoying story to people. I sit in this place, and these four African-American women, round about 75, 80 years old, get up and say, son, that isn't an old story. 
because Sancho struggles to find his papers to vote at the end of mm -hmm. the play. That isn't an old story. That's happening to us today. We have to find our papers to prove that we can vote. That's happening today. And he, she, they sat down and the audience erupted in applause. And I was like, my mm -hmm. God, this play is unfortunately relevant. Papers mm -hmm. prove who you are. Mm -hmm. Don't we're not going to presume because of the way you look that you belong here. In yeah. fact, the, quite the opposite. Yeah. Very precarious, the 18th century, and obviously beyond mm -hmm. for uh, black people. Well, yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot of a lot of uh, parallels in the economic situation. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm quite lost now. I think we'll have the fourth clip before we have the last. Good call. Lot of, uh, um, yes, let's have the fourth clip. I just love l seeing all of his dashes and exclamation marks and strange words. I'm going to read the last letter. Why not? I don't remember even reading this, so I'm just going to read this out loud. OK, so this is the very last letter, December the 7th, 1780. Two. Mr. Spink, Esquire, December the 7th, 1780. Dear Sir, I am doubly and trebly happy that I can in some measure remove the anxiety of the best couple in the universe. I set aside all thanks for were I to enter into the feelings of my heart for the past and present, I should fill the sheet, but you would not be pleased. In good truth, I have been exceeding ill. My breath grew worse, and the dropsy made large strides. I left off medicine by consent for four or five days, swelled immoderately. The good Dr. N, 80 miles distant, and Dr. Jeb heartily puzzled through the darkness of his patient. I began to feel alarm. When looking into your letter, I found a Dr. Smith recommended by yourself. I inquired, his character is great, but for lungs and dropsy, Sir John E, physician, extraordinary and ordinary, to his majesty is reckoned the first. I <laughs> love his grandness even at the end. I applied to him on Sunday. I mean, look at that. The king's doctor, you know, I applied to him on Sunday morning. He received me like Dr. N. I have faith in him. My poor belly is so distended that I write with pain. I hope next week to write with more ease. My dutiful respects await Mrs. Spink and self, to which Mrs. Sancho begs to be joined by her loving husband and your most grateful friend, Sancho. And the last thing it says is Mr. Sancho died December 14th, so his hopes of writing with more ease the next week didn't work out for him. That's so mm. poignant, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we're so lucky to have those letters. We're so lucky um, to have that his son was absolutely, you know, that was one of the things he was going to do, I don't know, you know, but a printer. Um, also, the way that your book is written, which although is lit, did you have any worries about how you were going to write the story out? You know, technically, craft, I'm talking, because this is your first novel. And a novel, I think it's, a, it's similar to acting in that it's fabulation. But you're sitting there, you're sitting down, and you've got this story, and you've got lots to sort of make, to shape. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done a really brilliant job in shaping it. Thank you. So how did that, how did that come about? Well, I mean, I, I, um, I'm a... I'm a master procrastinator, so, I mean, I started researching this in 99, it's 2022, come on. I mean, I should have written this at least a decade ago. But I, I didn't want to jump into it until I, the play, like, I, I was researching for about four years, reading the letters, until I put pen to paper. So this was also going to obviously be something like that. But the one thing that I... The one thing that I, I, I understood from what happened with the play was that I got all this information and made a story. Why would I start again? So it was about not reinventing the wheel. Uh -huh. So the framework of the play is the framework of the book. And then it took me to places that I wasn't expecting 
It took me to insecurities that I wasn't expecting, and it took me to challenging Sancho in ways that I wasn't expecting. Because after all, yes, he had a grocer's store. If you owned property, you could mm -hmm. vote. Women weren't allowed to own property, therefore there didn't have to be any <laughs> anti-gender laws. There didn't have to be any racist laws. You were never going to own property, so there was no need for any fuss to be made. But if you owned property, you could vote. He owned a grocer's store, so he voted, which is his famous thing. He's the first man of African descent to vote. But what is he selling? So Charles Street is now King Charles Street, on the corner of which is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Mm -hmm. The next street along is Downing Street. This isn't some little shop in the corner of Harlesden, you know, <laughs> where I, I grew up, and or Wilston Green, some little bric-a-brac shop, that, you know. This is at the heart of the seat of power in this country. That shop could not sell anything other than the goods that were demanded. What were they? Tobacco. Sugar, tobacco. I mean, rum. cocoa, rum, slave goods. Mm -hmm. Which is why I have him say, know thy father and forgive him because he wants to tell Billy, like a lot of fathers do. I know my father tried, he was, does that, you know. This is who I am, let me tell you a story about my life. He wants him to know, because things will be said. He knows things will be said of him. He wants Billy to know why he did this. And there's not an excuse. It's a series of events that lead to this. I don't want to make an excuse for Sancho because I don't know why he did it, mm -hmm. except what I can imagine would be the reason, and that's, Mm -hmm. the journey of the novel and the journey of Sancho and coming out of the, hey, I'm this person, I'm presenting myself in this amazing way to what am I actually thinking and what have I done was the reason, I suppose, the novel is kind of the final iteration and I didn't have to, I don't have to reinvent it because now I've fleshed out that play mm -hmm. and if ever I come to do a screen version of it, I won't... Well, I mean, television is a weird world. You can give a book away and they'll make whatever they like. Mm -hmm. So I am kind of determined to be that person who's steering that because I won't... I feel like if you did Oliver Twist in a sort of funky version, Bridgerton style, say, uh, a couple of years after it had come out, that would be the version of the Victorian era that we would remember. So something has to sit and become a story that we generally all sort of know before people can mess with it. So if, there, if there's going to be an iteration of it on screen, I want it to be as closely linked to the play, to the book, uh, as possible, so that we're not telling and retelling the story, which will then become fragmented and a bit vague. That's the attempt with this. And um, I hope I get close to it. I was going to ask, you've just answered my question there, but the, what I want to ask is, do you think, are you bitten by books now? What? Are you writing another book? Is it going to be like 10 years before we get another book? I off? love this question. Like, this, I mean, this is my first like, novel and people, uh, authors are talking to me like, what kind of question is that? It's like, oh, I've done this amazing movie. Yeah, what's your next <laughs> movie that you do? It's like, well, can I just have this? Let me enjoy this and then see... And I've heard about the difficult second no novel. Well, nobody wanted the first one, so that's okay. I'll just carry on in the same way, and nobody wants anything ever. Nobody's ever commissioned me to write any of the books <laughs> or plays that I've written, so I'm just going to do that. I mean, I've got a couple of people that I'm, I'm becoming, one I've been obsessed with for a while, and one I've just, like, discovered, a family member's like, what? Mm. So I might um, dig into their lives. What they'll, that'll be, I don't know. Uh -huh. It might be a sort of biography... I I'm determined never to write an autobiography, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But um, I might extrapolate that story and make it into something. But yeah, I, I definitely will keep writing because yeah, that's what I I'm, uh, I can't help it. There you go. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, have we? Oh, sorry, sorry, I've got to look at Rebecca like this. We're almost ready for questions. I was going to say. Do there are some for sale which are brilliant and you can get and, you, and your books for sale, isn't it? But please, if you've got any questions and people in the universe as well, um, anybody got their hands up? 
Oh, sorry, it's way over there. So I can point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you haven't mentioned anything about uh, Sancho's own dances, the ones that he published. Yeah. Have you tried to dance any of them? Because we do that now. There, there are so no. many. There are actually people now who specialise in dancing Sancho's dances, which are beautiful, and I'd really love to see you dancing them as well. Yes, I'd really love to see you no. dancing well, them. Well, what's interesting <laughs> is we have. Um, yes, great question. Thank you. See, this is the thing. When you dig into Sancho's story, he's so. He's, it's such a wide uh, area of interest that, of course, I locked onto the thing that I'm most interested in, which is the theatre side and the emotional family side. But there are some people who are musicians. So we have people like um, the Chineke Orchestra who are doing... The Chineke Orchestra are wonderful. They're doing lots of Sancho bits. If you, I mean, Sancho's music is now out there. When I first started looking, there was a wonderful website by a guy called Brick and Carey, and he was one of the few people who had anything in 1999, 2000 on Sancho, and then um, Vincent Coretta's letters. But the music, I've only really heard about 10 years maybe after I'd started, or eight, nine years after I'd started. But Chris Harrison, who's sitting there, sorry Chris, I'm name checking you, uh, he's doing wonderful work. I mean, he might even want to speak on the mic briefly about that, but Sancho's music, is available. Obviously, what you've heard, you can get at Park Music and you can get on... But that, that is, that is it's really important to me, but it's not my area of expertise. The, uh, the dance during the play, I don't know anybody here who saw the play at Wilton... There you go. Well, unfortunately, you probably would have been picked out straight away because I grab a member of the audience and we dance. And we dance... Um, uh, you know, the, he always has instructions. It's like a sort of line dancing thing. All around, each gentleman <laughs> turn their partner. Balance and rigadoon step. Each gentleman turn his partner the other way. Balance and rigadoon step. These are loads of country dances. I call it militantly joyful music. <laughs> He's in the center of the slave trade. He knows what's going on. And yet he refuses to write dirgy, sad, heavy funereal music. It's all dance music, it's pop music of the day, really. And uh, I, I love his music. I, I'm just not the expert on his music, but there are experts out there increasingly. And America's caught hold of it as a couple of um, Chinese uh, uh, violinists who are absolutely brilliant. Uh, a violinist and a, and a cellist who you can just YouTube Sancho's music and you'll see an amazing array of people who are beginning to discover his music and other black uh, classical musicians too, like uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who has some wonderful, wonderful music out there, and the extraordinary um, and extraordinarily named Samuel Coleridge Taylor, whose music makes me weep. Mm -hmm. And even if I had never known that he was a black mm -hmm. man, I mean, I love Faure, that Gabriel Faure is my go-to classical music um, and been for years, but honestly, uh, the lyricism and the beauty of Samuel Coleridge Taylor's work it has to be it's sublime. And he's, he's 19th century. Mm. He uh, was hugely popular in his time. Of course he was. He's a Massively beautiful, beautiful popular. composer. Um, yes, we, oh, we've got a question from the internet. Uh, yeah, we've got a, a question from home, and then I'm going to slide in and ask my own question as well. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Um, you, you might have just answered this, to be honest. It's a question from Catherine. Um, so she just wants to know more about Sancho as a composer. So you said it's not your area of expertise, but I mean, do you know much about when he uh, first started composing or I mean, any, uh, anything about his, his journey? And yeah, I mean, a composer, if you're a musician, you're a musician. As soon as you can get hold of a piece of, uh, if, you know, an instrument, you'll be composing. And even if you haven't got a, an instrument, you'll make things up in your head. He had music dancing in his head. He clearly did, and that came out, and there's loads and loads of his music, so he was obviously prolific. So uh, he would have always been composing, but 1760s, which is a sort of gap era, we don't really know what happened to him for about a decade during his life. The book tries to help with that, but we don't know where he was. But I know that by the time he met Anne, in about sort of, um, he met Anne roughly sort of 57, maybe 58, in, we imagine, that's when he began uh, sort of releasing his music, and his music became 
reasonably well known. And he wrote a book uh, on the theory of music, which is now lost, they say. Why, how they know he wrote that book, I don't know. It may well be in the archives that, that it's noted. And it, the book was dedicated to Princess Charlotte, who was the Princess Royal. And I think that's... Because you've got to have permission to be asking the royal family if you can put that in the next... So, obviously, he was playing music for the royal family. They must have known the level of skill he had. And, um, yeah, so he was... He was probably a musician first before he was an actor or anything else. I'm just going to ask my own question as well. And so one of the most satisfying parts of research I find is finding descendants and mm. searching or getting you know, approached by the great-great-grandchildren. Are you aware of any Sancho's walking around today? Obviously with nine children, I presume he has lots of them. Um, yeah, have, you been, have you tried to find them or has anyone ever... No, I mean, what's the extraordinary thing is, yes, he had all those children and there are no descendants that we know of. I mean, somebody, I think I said this the other day at an event, um, DM'd me on Twitter, a direct message, messaged me on Twitter, and said, oh, well, Jaden Sancho, the footballer, he's a Sancho. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 where do you know this information from? Silence for about three years now. So... Uh, we don't know. It's ridiculous that we don't know. It seems bizarre that we don't know, and yet we don't know. They've got Francis... People have found Francis Barber's descendants, haven't they? Well, English? Francis Barber was... Uh, d don't presume that people know this, I don't Sorry. think. But Francis Barber was uh, the heir to Samuel Fortune's... Samuel, Samuel Johnson. Johnson's fortune. He, he, was, he was his ward. He came to him from St Kitts, uh, probably when he was about seven or eight. And Samuel Johnson, that was his, it was his son. Mm. He really... Anybody who saw them, they, they, were, they were like father and son. And actually, um, he was a bit of a rebel when he was a teen and decided he wanted to go to sea, which sounds like an, just a immensely <laughs> risky thing for a, you know, a reasonably, I guess, well-educated boy, but who is black, to go to sea. But he did, and uh, did that for many years, and then came back and was the chief carer, really, mm -hmm. for the very eccentric, but obviously um, sort of deeply paternal Samuel Johnson. And then him and his wife, uh, Mary, Suzanne, sorry, uh, moved to Shropshire, where Johnson was originally from. Mm -hmm. So their kids are, yeah, still running they're, about. They're there, yeah. 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 Any more questions from all you lovely people? Yeah. Thank you. Get my steps in. <laughs> oh, God, a long way away. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't you have shouted the qu You could have shouted it from there. Hello. Um, yeah. The other day I was down at Millbank. There's a um, memorial to the, the people that were transported to Australia, etc. And it got me thinking. My granddad came from Jamaica in June 1939, lived down the road in Fitzroy St Street and got stuck here for obvious reasons, never went back. My dad came in 55, my mum came in 58. They all came with British passports. Um, and my dad lived to the ripe old age of 102. He wow. passed away a few years ago. Um, but even in his last years, the one thing, if you, came, if you went to his house, he would take you and show you a framed copy of his naturalization um, certificate from 1980, whatever, when Thatcher made, us, made them do that. Um, and I never really got why that was so important to him until the whole Windrush thing. So talking about papers and, you know, nationalities, blah, blah, blah. I do wonder if people knew more, British people, white people knew more about their own history, working class history, about, you know, belonging. They, they seem to praise these statues and blah, 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 but they don't seem to know their working class history of, of what it meant and how much commonality there is between immigrants and working class people. Do you think maybe if they knew their history more that there wouldn't be such hostility and separation? When stories like this are told, does it open doors to that? Such a great, great question. What an amazing story. Uh -huh. Please tell your story, however you do it. Write it, even if it's just for yourself and for your family, please, because these get lost. Record your parents talking about what they know and what they remember, please. These things can get lost so very quickly in a generation, it's gone. Um, I just think, if you are living in a family and you don't know what several of your siblings went through, you don't really know your family. You only know your bit. You only know your story. 
So when a member of that family pipes up and says, Oi, can I get in on this, please? You've never done... What are you doing? Of course, because they don't know the full story. And it is incumbent on educators to educate the people of a particular country about their country. All of it. Like I said the other day, no, no family therapist would say, let's just not talk about that anymore. Can we just get on with it, bury it, and move on? We've all forgotten it. I didn't do anything. It was my grandfather. Can we just bury this thing and carry on? Well, you're going to say, that's no therapist that I want to be with. I want you to go digging and find out who's who, why this person is behaving like this, and why this person has this attitude to that person. And it would be better if we knew. Not saying it would be a glorious country, we'd be skipping through the fields, but we would at least not be easily hostile to people who don't look like us, because we'll know that there are stories there that connect us to each and other. Is, when I walked, I must say this, yeah. when I walked through London, I was doing a film of the, uh, the, for the play, the first iteration of the play. I just cobbled some money together and some equipment, and we just did that first thing. And I was walking along the South Bank, dressed as Sancho, wig and all, fat suit and all. Can you imagine the looks I was getting? Hello, my dear. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, very nice to see you all. Uh, good evening. Hello. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, as we were passing St. Paul's, we were, I could see St. Paul's, I was on my way to the Globe. We were going to do something out there. I was like, this feels really good. <laughs> this feels like I've, been, I've gone to a time machine, and I've gone, I said, because Sancho was that guy. You know, if people were on the street, he would greet them. If they, you know, you know disrespected him, he would come back at them, the famous, you know, smoke Othello. I saw such Othellos you meet with, but once in a century, such Iagos as you we meet with in every dirty passage. Proceed, sirs. Which was noted down as a thing he said. So that, as I was walking along, I was thinking, you know what? This feels good. And later, I think that's even why I've got red boots. I bought these in like 2016. So like I'm, I wasn't that fancy a dresser. But there's something about going, I'm right here. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. I belong here. What do you think? Mm -hmm. That's what it's done for me, Catherine. It's made me feel like this country is my country yeah. too. And I'm not even talking about the slavery and the fact that we all built this place because of the blood, sweat, and tears of dead ancestors. Lloyds of London, Barclays, just Google it. It's about me. I was born here. Mm -hmm. I was born in Park Royal. I didn't speak any other language mm -hmm. until, unfortunately, I married a French person. No, it's lovely. But then I did, until I was 30-odd, I didn't speak any other language but, but, but English. My parents wouldn't teach me to speak quail. Where do I belong? What do, you, what do you call somebody who's born in Sweden, grows up in Sweden, has all their schooling, has never left Sweden until they were like 15 on a day trip to Norway, comes back... They're 25 years old, all their schooling, all their education, they speak Swedish. What do you call that person? A Swede. If I said, I'm English, I can feel it. It's a frisson of, can we? Well, what am I then? I'm but some blob in the middle of the Atlantic. Yeah. I belong here. I can go anywhere I like, but when I come here, I'm home. St. Lucia, I love St. Lucia. I love St. Lucia. But you want to they call me in St. Lucia? Mm, Englishman. Mm. <laughs> Englishman. I lived in France. If you ever say to a French person, uh, vous viens d'où? Where are you from? Oh, je suis britannique. They laugh their heads off. Why? Because it sounds like, I am Britain. <laughs> britannique is British, but it doesn't sound right. So what do you have to say? Anglais. Je suis anglais. Je suis anglais. I can say je suis anglais in French, but I'm not allowed to go, I'm English without this. No, I think this is And that's because we don't know the, the story, and so we don't belong anywhere. Yeah. So let's belong somewhere, have our stories told. Walter Mosley, the American writer, says, a people that, are n that is not present in the fiction of their country, mm -hmm. in the literature of their country, can be considered to not exist at all. So if we're not in the stories, how can we possibly know that we belong here? We're not in the stories, not included, so we're not included. W, four letters, out. N word, out. That's all I saw in Wills and Green, Halston and Kilburn when I was growing up on walls. How does that make you feel? I was born in Park Royal. I lived above a shop in Wills and Green. 
where, where am I supposed to go? Mm -hmm. And so I said, Lucia, it was home, 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 until I was 18 and I went, <laughs> what am I talking about? Yeah. If I go to St. Lucia now, I, well, I can't speak the language, I don't, I don't act like any, I'm too fast, I'm too efficient, I'm too, I want to do, and everybody's just like, slow down. And they can tell who you are, because you're like, <laughs> compared to everybody else. So I belong here, whether I like it or not, I'm an Englishman. I think, I think that's so true, and that's what historical fiction, I mean, that's been my mission for the past four oh, years. It says, this is home, this is, and, and I, same for me, I used to be, so used to just say, I'm a Londoner, if anybody asks. That's right. But as I've not lived in London for 10 years, and I say, this is what English looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yes, I, I agree, it's about, it's about staking our claim, but it's also, it's everyone's history. Yes. It's our history, it's everyone's history. It's really it's the important. full picture, it's just a full picture. Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. Sorry, we're supposed to be taking questions. Um, yes, Sandra Agard. Lovely. Catherine, um, congratulations, Patterson. Thank you. Nice wonderful, to see you again. wonderful. Your reading, it, it just sent me, it's just outstanding. And congratulations, Catherine, on your book. Thank you. Which I should have brought tonight so you could sign it. Thank you, Auntie. But I just want to say, it's all about education. Yeah. It's about teaching in schools. It's about having your book there, Catherine. It's about having your book now, um, Patterson. It's about schools. It's about re-educating and getting our children and to, to learn their histories. And that's what we've got to do. And that's what we're trying to do here at the British Library. With the schools program, I have to plug it. <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Say that again and louder, please. Yeah, with the schools program, <laughs> British Library, that's what we're doing here. And the whole, and the whole learning team. But, but it's really important that I feel that these books, and I know in the audience there are some other writers who write um, historical books. Miss Brown, I know she's here. She's yeah. right there. Shy, yeah. shy, shy, Brown, shy, shy. Who's written Who's this she? amazing series about yes. Betsy Sancho. Absolutely. Yeah. It's about getting those books in schools mm -hmm. and, and plugging those books yeah. and yourself mm -hmm. and other writers. Growing up, I was born in England, in London. Growing up, the book I read as a child was Little Black Sambo. Mm -hmm. Hated it with passion, but it was the only book that reflected a black character. And if I had had your books, it would have been sublime. And that's what we've got to redress now. Thank a you. shame. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we've got another one over here. So we've just, we've just got time, I think, probably for one more question. So I'll just hand the mic. To you. Um, actually, I'm going to make a statement. Congratulations, of course. Um, Thank my you. name is Elaine. I'm from um, Pegasus Academy Trust. We're primary schools. And I am proud to say that your book features heavily in our school, your books. Oh, thank you. Freedom is right there. Your new book about um, Oludea Aquina was in our school. Hero is there. Um, Race to the Frozen uh, North is there thank in you. our schools. Um, we really make a point of trying to let our children know that they have a reason to be here. Mm -hmm. I remember David Olushoga saying that when he first read uh, Peter Fryer's Stay in Power, it gave him a warrant to be in this country, mm -hmm. and that I find very moving. Um, Mr. Joseph, if I may, when I first saw you being interviewed saying um, that when you first found out about uh, uh, Ignatius, you were so moved and you were so also so troubled that you didn't know. And the passion that you showed in that, I really felt that, and it was actually my, the inspiration, both of you have been an inspiration for me to push for um, black and diverse histories in our schools, which are in Croydon, very close to uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor's uh, yes. uh, um, old haunt. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to really thank you both so much um, for all the work that you have done. I have at least, in fact, I have um, <coughs> at least two of your books here with me. <laughs> and also, and also you, Mr. Patterson's, we have Freedom, which is an incredibly moving book. I am, thank you. My, my, um, I'd like to enjoy this woman, please. Um, and of course, I have your book here with me too and hoping for you to be able to sign them. Of course. But um, I do recall, I mean, my, pa my parents are also from Jamaica, 1959. 
1960. My father came on the Ascania ship, uh, passenger 246, uh, came here, booted, suited and booted, with nothing in his pocket, but he was ready. <laughs> he was ready to rebuild this place mm -hmm. and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. But what I do also remember, thank, thank you so much. Um, what I do also remember is one of the, I can't remember which one it was, but certainly one of the prime ministers of Jamaica had said, listen to the stories, share the stories, because whenever an elder passes away, it's like a library burning mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And for yeah. me, I am so inspired by everyone here to keep doing, trying to do the right thing and teach the children mm -hmm. um, and just keep going. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well said. Everybody, everybody has a story. Yes. White, black, everybody has a story. And you, your ancestors have stories. Record, we've got these brilliant phones now where you can just go, voice recorder, mum, where did the granddad come from? You will be amazed at what pops out of people's heads. Oh, yeah, by the way, he was a circus juggler. What? Lion so tamer. Many people do that. Lion tamer. And lion tamer. You know, you don't know. Just ask yeah. so you know. You've got to know your story. You've got to know your story. And there are fascinating stories out here. Absolutely. All fascinating. Sorry. Yeah. Do not apologise. It's been absolutely amazing, and thank you um, to the audience for such thoughtful and um, revealing questions. I suppose as well for honesty and candour, and um, to Catherine and to Patterson. This has just been a, a wonderful event. I just want yeah. to add my praise to your book, Patterson, um, from a historian's point of view. It feels like you're, you're writing from the past. I don't know how you've done it. It feels like I'm reading an 18th century diary. So, Well, Doctor Who <laughs> and that time machine. <laughs> I finally used it. Good. <laughs> but um, can we just give a huge round of applause to Patterson? Thank you. I forgot to talk about Sudeep. There's so much I didn't say. Thank you.